is I'm going to play a little video that I found online, and it is uh, on the topic of the pre-tribulation rapture. And uh, this, this, you know, I just, I don't know who this teacher preacher is and what the channel is. It just happened to be uh, something that I came across. So I, I thought I'd play a couple of minutes of it to give you an idea of the type of things that people teach in regards to this topic, but through in regards to the Bible in general. And to me, it seems like it's so childish and so immature at best and downright deceptive and blasphemous in uh, the worst uh, possible way, you know, that if uh, the intent here is deception, intentional, then it is a very, very evil teaching that is being taught here. Hi there, I'm Lee Reard. Welcome to Soothkey. Tonight I would like to encourage your hearts with another rapture nugget. The precious truth that soon we will be leaving this defiled world for our mansions in heaven. Now, one of my favorite passages in the Bible is John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, where we read, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, this is a really precious promise. This means that the Lord is in heaven right now. This very moment, this very week, this very year, preparing mansions for every believer. The God who knows the very number of the hairs on your head, he also knows your favorite colors, your dream home wishes, your interior decorating preferences. And he will present to you in that glorious day your dream home one that you will enjoy for all of eternity. All right, I think I will stop it there. What this man is teaching us is that the Lord, that is Jesus, is up there. You know, he's got some kind of, he's like as a mason or a carpenter. He's working away, chipping stones and cutting, you know, maybe shaping metals, et cetera, building these mansions of a brick and stone or metal and glass or something like that for us. And this God knows that this is our dream home. First of all, that expression, dream, to have a dream, is a very evil one. Because, you know, a person only dreams when they are asleep. And Jesus clearly tells us, Awake thou that sleepest, and Christ shall give thee light. When the light of the knowledge of God enters into our mind, we are no longer in a state of slumber or sleep. We are awake. We are awake to his word. We are awake to his knowledge. We are awake to the deceptions and lies of this world. We are not dreaming. God, this man is talking about earthly things. What do people want on this earth? They want mansions, right? That's what he's talking about. That God knows the color scheme you like. Oh, honey, shall it be? Shall we do black and gold or shall we do blue and green? You know what I mean? Okay. Shall we do like, you know, uh, six bedrooms or whatever? That's what he's talking about. But as we shall see this whole teaching on these mansions, it is so ridiculous that uh, a person, only one that is totally ignorant of the word of God, and that is who is actually ignorant of who God is, can teach something like this. Okay, But this is just a sampling, I'm sure, of tens of thousands of people or preachers and teachers, maybe more, that teach this very lies and these very lies and deceptions every day of the week. YouTube is filled with them. The internet is filled with them. Churches are filled with them. All right, so let's start here. Okay. So we will, uh, last week, you know, I had begun and I had talked about, uh, I posted a video which was on the Titus 2.13, which is called the Blessed Hope. And you know how that scripture is twisted to make it mean that it is referring to a secret pre-tribulation rapture when it does no such thing. So the reason I began this study, which I'm still in the process of completing, is turning out to be longer than I thought it was going to be. 
But, you know, that's good. I like long studies, so I hope you do as well. So, you know, this was a, a comment, and it said, you know, the pre-tribulation rapture versus the second coming. What we do know from the Bible is that the rep rapture is a separate, distinct event from the second coming. Here are, are 10, 10, 10 irrefutable proofs for the pre-tribulation rapture. So irrefutable means that they cannot be disproven. Well, as we shall see, you know, they are actually very easily disproven. So they are not irrefutable at all. They are very easily refuted. The pre-tribulation rapture is the blessed hope, while the second coming is a day of great woe. In Titus 2.13, talking about the rapture. So I'm going to go through one, one with these points one by one, okay? And then uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to finish this all by tomorrow and then put this on the shelf for a while. Because, you know, I think I have done enough studies on this lie of this pre-tribulation rapture. And the only thing in doing the study again in perhaps greater detail is that I myself have learned many new things about what God is actually teaching in his word. And it has benefited me. It has profited me. And I think it will those who are serious students of God's word as well. The pre-tribulation rapture is the blessed hope while the second coming is a day of great war. In Titus 2.13, talking about the rapture, Paul calls it the blessed hope a day of great comfort and joy. From Chad Thomas's Watchmen on the Wall, Article 88, uh, Wall 88, Article titled The Rapture, why it's called the Blessed Hope. Why are we to look for that blessed hope? What is so blessed and why should our hope be in it? I'll tell you why, because it is an event where the Lord will remove Christians that are truly his before the coming judgment of God on this Christ-rejecting world. But in Amos 5.18, talking about the day of the Lord, which is in fact the second coming of Jesus Christ, uh, which it is not. The day of the Lord is ends with the second coming of Jesus Christ. But the day of the Lord is not just the second coming of Jesus Christ, okay? Which I believe I clarified last week. But I just wanted to you know mention that again, that the day of the Lord is what is called the period of the tribulation, what I call the days of the last generation, which are going to be a period of time of about, you know, almost 40 years just before the return of Jesus, before his second coming, in which the world as we presently know it is going to be pretty much destroyed and some 90% of the people that are living on this earth and, you know, almost all the beasts, etc., are going to be dead, at least the, those that are living in the sea. We are told that all living creatures in the sea are going to die. So that period is, the whole period is the day of the Lord. It's a period of almost 38 years whereas the second coming of Jesus Christ, which we should also see, is something which takes a little bit longer than just it is not an instantaneous event. It also transpires in certain stages over a certain period of time. But this period of time is not like 38 years or so. It is more like you know, a few weeks or a couple of months at best, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ. So in Amos 5.18, talking about the day of the Lord, which is in fact, not just the second coming of Jesus Christ. The second coming of Jesus Christ is the signal of the end of the day of the Lord, but it is not the entire day of the Lord. God tells us that it is a day of great woe, which we understand when we read chapters like Matthew 24 about the beginning of sorrows and then the sorrows continuing to multiply and build for the rest of the chapter. As we read in the book of Revelation, when the seals are opened and uh, a quarter of the population is already dead by the time of the fourth seal, and then we go on into even greater woes like that of the trumpets and uh, then finally into the time of great wrath and of the wiles and the judgment of Babylon. Yeah, it truly is a great time of great war and greatly to be feared. Now, how can the rapture and second coming be the same? Okay, because this verse of scripture, Titus 2.13, is not talking about any kind of rapture. Paul calls the rapture of the church the day of Christ. Okay. As I already explained to you that the day of the Lord is the entire tribulation where the day of Christ is his second coming. So, you know, they are related events, but they are not exactly the same. OK, so, yes, so the day of the Lord is longer than the day of Christ, but the day of Christ is not the rapture. The second coming is called the day of the Lord. The day of Christ is to be looked forward to. The day of the Lord is to be feared. Yeah, yeah, the day of Christ is to be looked forward to by some, those who are watching and praying. The rest of the world is going to wish that they never saw that day, okay? So no, the day of the Lord is only to be looked forward to by those who are watching and praying. You understand the times and who may still be alive uh, as they make their way through this time of tribulation. 
The day of Christ is to be looked forward to. The day of the Lord is to be feared. Titus 2.13, KJV, the rapture. So he's saying Titus 2.13 is teaching the rapture. And I've done like a very lengthy study on Titus 2.13, uh, especially verses 11 through 14, which is one sentence. Okay. Yet nobody talks about verse 11, verse 12, and verse 14, which are a part of the same teaching. They just pick, you know, verse 13 out of it and say that this is talking about the rapture. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.2, which I also taught on last week, it says that is uh, the rapture. Okay, He's telling that the rapture is Second Thessalonians 2.2, 2, which is anything but the rapture. And then Amos 5.18 is the second coming. And Isaiah 39 is the second coming. Now, I've already discussed in detail uh, Titus 2.13, that in no way did the Apostle Paul teach that the blessed hope is the hope of being raptured out of the world before the time of tribulation, which would benefit only a very small number of believers that would be alive in the last generation. But rather, it refers to the hope of resurrection, which is a hope for all believers of all generations, and all believers have been hoping and waiting for this over a period of time of some thousands of years, okay? That is hope. Hope in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, it is always a hope of salvation. It is a hope of attaining eternal life, which only happens through the resurrection. And people don't understand what resurrection means. Resurrection means like Jesus died, but then he rose again, and death no longer has dominion over him. And that is what it means for us, that though this body we live in will die, God is going to take the person that lives in the body, which is the soul, and he is going to raise it, resurrect it, by building for it a new house about which we will talk, a new body which is incorruptible. And once the soul is housed in an incorruptible body that can never die, the person is being resurrected, has been raised back to life forever because that cannot die. That is the hope. That is the hope of eternal life, the hope of salvation, the promise of salvation, the hope of resurrection. And this is the hope that every believer, whoever believed in Jesus Christ, no matter which generation they lived in, whether they lived at the time of Moses or Abraham even, or even the days of Enoch, the patriarch, it doesn't matter. Believers are not limited to those who are believing after the time of Jesus. After in the New Testament, believers have been people of faith like Abraham, like Noah. They have existed since the time of Adam. And this is the hope. Even Job said that. Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and I will see him in the flesh. Okay, Because he had the hope of resurrection in the Old Testament. So the hope of resurrection has belonged to all believers of all times, of all generations. And this is the hope that they have been waiting for its fulfillment for a period of some thousands of years, not just for one generation, the last generation before the return of Jesus. I also elaborated on 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, that rather than proving a pre rapture, it proves the opposite that the gathering together of the saints of the elect, which is generally called the rapture, will not occur until at least after the Antichrist has been revealed. That's what 2 Thessalonians 2 teaches. And how this person can say the 2 Thessalonians 2.2 2 is a pre trib rapture. Oh man, you can't even twist scriptures because it's so plain there. So it's just a blatant lie. That's what the person is teaching is a lie because they're all liars. You know, I have, I, I really, they, they make me angry now, all these lying teachings, because there's such obvious lies that, you know, you have to be intentional deceivers. They can't be that stupid to actually believe this when the, when the, when Second Thessalonians are clearly telling them, telling us, you know, that the gathering together is not going to take place until the man of sin, that the man of sin has been revealed. And they go around and tell you, you know, that, yeah, it's going to be the pre-tribulation, you're going to be raptured out of here. Okay. How is that even possible to come to that conclusion? I don't understand it. But I also elaborated last week on 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, that rather than proving a pre trib rapture, it proves the opposite, that the gathering together of the saints, which are generally called the rapture, will not occur until at least after the Antichrist has been revealed. 
which is also apparent from the book of Revelation in which the Son of Man comes to reap his harvest in Revelation chapter 14. If we assume that the Son of Man is sitting in a cloud with a, with a sickle in his hand and he reaps, that is what we call the rapture. That is when the elect of God who are still left on the earth, which I believe are going to be a very few number, they are going to be reaped and taken up to him where? To meet him in the clouds. Where is the Son of Man in Revelation 14? He is on the cloud. So they're going to meet him in the cloud and then they're going to continue back on to heaven? No, that is another false teaching. They will remain with him up there until they come back down to the earth with him on the Mount of Olives. Okay, so that happens in Revelation 14 after the time of beast reign on earth and after the time of the mark of the beast. So these scriptures are always twisted to try a pre and prove a pre trib rapture, but it cannot be proven even from a simple, plain, cursory reading of these verses of scripture. It's nowhere in them. So the devil is lying. Okay, He's lying to your face. These preachers that teach this, they're lying to your face. Some of them are lying to themselves, but a lot of them, they'll know they're liars. They're paid to lie to you. Okay. The second point is in the pre-tribulation rapture, these irrefutable, tell and refutable proofs. So, you know, so that proof has already been refuted about this blessed hope. It's got nothing to do with the pre-tribulation rapture. Titus, the whole book of Titus is called a pastoral writing. There are three writings, there are three letters in the New Testament, first and second Timothy and Titus, which were written to, which are called pastoral letters because they were written to pastors. Timothy was the pastor of a church, as was Titus. And these letters are basically based on the conduct of believers between themselves and the hierarchy of the church, how it should be built and how governance of that should take place. That's what it's about. It's not prophetic. It's not eschatological. It talks nothing about coming, you know, end of the world or last days or, you know, second coming, etc. Even when it's mentioned in in uh, in uh, second in Titus two thirteen about the appearing of our you know great God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it is to 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 tell us that the hope of our blessed hope of resurrection will be completed at the second coming. It's got nothing to do with the pre trib rapture. So this is the second irrefutable proof. Let's see if it is a proof of anything at all. In the pre tribulation rapture, Jesus will return for his saints at his second coming. At the second, okay, at the pre tribulation rapture, Jesus will return for his saints, period. At the second coming, he will return with his saints. Paul teaches over and over again that at the rapture, the church is taken up and out from off the face of the earth. But at the second coming, Jesus returns with his saints. Another fatal difference when trying to reconcile the two events is one. The first, it's a going up, and the second, it's a coming down. The church had no part in the first 69 weeks of Daniel, and it will have no part in the 70th week. So then he quotes uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, on which I've already done a detailed study, more than one, as a matter of fact, I believe. And, you know, in the video I posted last week, by the way, for those of you who want to study these topics in more detail, or you want to share it with some people that may believe in this pernicious doctrine, I put in the description, I put uh, links to possibly like, you know, 10 or 12 or maybe more videos on this very topic of the pre-tribulation rapture in which I covered like, you know, Titus 2.13 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, about the twinkling of an eye and so many more scriptures, so many more teachings on this lie of this pre-trib rapture that anybody who even takes like, you know, time to watch those videos through once, will never ever believe in this evil doctrine ever again. Okay, so he's saying that the first Thessalonians 4, 16, 17 is proving the rapture where it does no such thing. And the Revelation 19, 24 is the second coming, which it is, which it is. But as we shall see, the so-called rapture is also a part of the second coming. So without going into details about seven, Daniel's 70 weeks, on which I have never read or heard a satisfactory teaching. It is patently false that the church had no part in Daniel's first 69 weeks. That's what this man wrote, right? That uh, the church had no part in the first 69 weeks of Daniel. Well, let's see. Church means an assembly of the people of God, whether in the Old Testament or in the New. In Stephen's discourse before the evil Pharisees, who later stoned him, he called the assembly 
under Moses in the wilderness, the church. You can read that in, in Acts chapter 7. Okay, this word which he applied to that assembly back in the day under Moses when they came out of Egypt, he called it the church. That is the word G1571 in Strong's Concordance. It is the word ecclesia, which whose primary meaning is an assembly. And this is the same word used for church of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, wherever the word church is used. Generally, this is the word ecclesia. Okay. And this is the same word that Jesus himself used in his letter to the churches in the book of Revelation. So the church of Jesus, who was the rock that led the Israelites, began under Moses. That is when God first assembled together a group of people as his own. That was the beginning of the church. Okay, So to say that there was no church in Daniel's 69 weeks is false. Because what they're trying to tell us is that the church at this time means an assembly of believers who are all Gentiles. And that we shall also see very shortly is an outright lie. There has never existed a church which consisted only of Gentile believers. Never and never will. So the church of Jesus, who was the rock that led the Israelites, began under Moses when God delivered the people out of Egypt. Moreover, we know that God made no distinction between the Israelites in the wilderness and the people that came to believe in him later at the time of Jesus and of the apostles. And this is apparent from scriptures such as Hebrews 4.2, in which we read that the gospel was preached to them also. The same gospel that has been preached to us was preached to the church or to the assembly of the Israelites under Moses, which is the church in the wilderness. And it is the same gospel that is preached to us. So if that assembly was called the church and the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached to them just as it, be, as it has been to us, then there is no difference between the church of the Old Testament and the church in the New. In the Old Testament, most members of the church were of the stock of Israel. That is, their bodily descent was from Israel of J or, from, or also named Jacob, who was Abraham's grandson. In the beginning of the New Testament church on the day of Pentecost, okay, you could say that, you know, this assembly or reassembly was the, this same body of believers, which became a religious cult almost under the time of the Pharisees, was reorganized, okay? It is not that a church did not exist prior to that time, as we have read that it did, and the Bible teaches us just as much, who also preached the gospel, that is, they had been given a promise the promise was to enter into the promised land with the understanding that later on that they would be brought into life through the Messiah who was going to come and bring them eternal life. That was the same promise that we have been given was given to them as well. Okay, The prophets prophesied of the coming of the Messiah and the revealing of life that would be made available to them. So the gospel was preached to them because they were the church. Okay, But this church had a reorganization where their faith, rather than in God, who they did not know, would be now the God that had revealed to themselves as love through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that their faith would now be in someone that they had seen and touched and handled, as we read in the book of 1 John. So their faith was now in something or someone that they had now seen who had revealed himself to them, whereas he had been hidden in the time of the Old Testament. So their faith was now redirected, but it was the same church. So the New Testament church, you could say, in this manner, had a beginning in the day of Pentecost. And those members of this church, as were the church members in the wilderness under Moses, they also began, this church of the day of Pentecost also began with mostly Israelite members, that they were from the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. Most of them were Jews, but there were also Gentile converts in the church right from the beginning. As we can read in Acts chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, of the vast number of races and peoples that were present in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, many of whom came to believe and were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay, So they were not all Jews. And this is an important point. Because the point is 
that ne that never has there ever been an exclusively Israelite or exclusively Gentile church in the world, which is a division that these guys, you know, they like to make all the time, all the church age, meaning it's only Gentiles who are members of this church and Israel, you know, meaning only people who are the stock of Israel. Okay. I spoke about the restoration of Israel and what that means. It's got nothing to do with a temple building or any such thing. It is something that they are going to be restored to the faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who is still hidden to them, will be revealed to them, and they will come to understand that their Jehovah is Jesus. That their God, who has been waiting for, is this Messiah, who came in the form of man named Jesus. They will come to that understanding. That is the restoration. It got nothing to do with them going back to the Old Testament laws or building a temple, et cetera, et cetera. But that I'm not going to go into it here again. I've been talking about that lately in some of my videos in the recent, uh, you know, last couple of weeks or a month or so. So you're more than welcome to go and watch them, especially that uh, the ones that are made on the so-called Israel deception. The point is that there has never been an exclusively Israelite or exclusively Gentile church in this world. The church has always included both Israelites and Gentiles, even in the days of Moses. Moses himself married a Midianite woman. And you can read that in Exodus 2.21. And later, in the wilderness, after they had come out of Egypt, he married an Ethiopian woman. So he had an Ethiopian wife. Read that in Numbers 12.1. And the point is that this teaching that there is an assembly of the people of God who are exclusively Gentiles, which can be identified in this term, in this time as the church, and that this, therefore, this is the church age of the Gentiles, is a false teaching. There never has been an exclusively Gentile church, and there never will be. So the church will continue to exist here on earth right up to the time of the second coming and the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and will continue and the church will continue on with him into the eternal future. This division of the people of God into Israel and Gentiles after the day of Pentecost is a deceptive division, which is not provable from scripture and has been created only to cause confusion. The argument that the rapture is going up, the second coming is coming down is also a deceptive argument. When we understand that it is second coming, Jesus will be descending as he must since he's coming from heaven above us and must necessarily keep descending until he gets down to earth and lands in the Mount of Olives. So there's nothing, you know, uh, you don't need to be, as they say, a rocket scientist to understand that if he's coming from up there, he is going to be descending. Now, we also know that a small number of living believers on earth at that time will be caught up to meet him in the air. So they must necessarily ascend up to meet him, even as he is descending down for them at his second coming. So just because Jesus will be descending, and the small number of believers that will still be alive on earth will be ascending to meet him in the air in the clouds does not prove a pre-trib rapture. As I've already explained in detail, that the second coming is not an instantaneous event, but transpires over a period of time, possibly some weeks or even a couple of months. Then it becomes clear that the gathering together of the elect, about which we read in Matthew 24, 31, for example, and also in Revelation chapter 14, where the you know, son of man uh, harvests his bride, his elect, okay? So the gathering together of the elect, which is falsely called the rapture, we understand that this is just one event among the many that are part of the second coming events that begin with the appearing of the sign of the son of man in heaven, as we read about, which, about which we read in Matthew 24, 30, 30, 24, 30 and it ends with him, with Jesus descending to the earth. With the, and it ends with the descending to earth by the Lord Jesus on the Mount of Olives, as we read in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. The believers that were alive on earth when the sign of the Son of Man first appeared, after which Jesus sends out to his angels to gather together his elect. So the ones that were alive on the earth, about which you read in 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter verse 16, we which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds in the air to meet the Lord Jesus. And from then they will forever be with the Lord, but not in heaven. 
first in the air, they'll meet him in the air above the earth, in the clouds where he will be. And then on the earth, as they will now descend down with him to the Mount of Olives. Okay. So this guy made an argument, you know, that Jesus is coming down, the believers are going up. And therefore, what, they're going to just pass each other? And the believers are just going to continue going on to heaven? Or Jesus is going to catch them and take them back up to heaven? There's no such, te there's no such teaching in the Bible. None. None. All we know is that, you know, when Jesus' sign appears, then he sends out his angels to gather together the elect. They are with him in the air. They're up there between heaven and earth, which is also an important symbolism here as to why this meeting must take place in the air, which I've spoken in the past. But from that point onwards, Jesus doesn't continue back and starts ascending again. No, he will continue descending down. So the second coming begins with the appearing of the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, Matthew 24, 30, and ends with the descending to earth by the Lord Jesus on the Mount of Olives, as we read in Zechariah 14, 4. So the believers that were alive on earth, when the sign of the Son of Man first appeared, will be caught up in the clouds in the air to meet the Lord Jesus. And from then, they will forever be with the Lord, not in the present heaven, but first in the air above the earth and then back down on this earth as they descend down with him to the Mount of Olives. So at the second coming, at the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he comes for the saints. As this man writes, you know, in the rapture he comes for the saints, but in his second coming he comes with the saints. So he first comes for the saints. He gathers together his elect, not just from the earth, but from everywhere all four winds of heaven, four corners of heaven, as we read. He first comes for the saints, both in heaven and on earth, and then he comes down with the saints to the earth. These are not two separate events, but rather two stages of the same event. Once the elect from the four corners of heaven and the earth have been gathered together to meet him in the air, not in heaven and not on the earth, they do not go back up to heaven, but come down to earth with him, and will forever be with him. Once all the elect have been gathered together, very few of whom are going to be gathered from the earth, they would never again go back up to the present heaven. When Jesus begins his descent from this heaven to come down to earth for his second coming, he will not be going back up to the present heaven, but will first reign on this very earth for a thousand years. And then this entire present creation will be burnt up, as we read in 2 Peter 3.10. And then God will make the eternal creation to come, beginning with the new heaven and the new earth. So that is going to be the permanent home, the eternal home of the Lord and of all his elect. Okay, Not this present heaven and not this present earth. So the elect will not be with Jesus in the present heaven, but first they will be with him on this earth and then in the new heaven, in the new Jerusalem, on the new earth. The race of man has not been given a home in the present heaven. No, this home, this heaven is the home of the host of heaven, not of the sons of man. Man's home is the earth. The earth has he given to man. This we read in the Bible. For a thousand years, it will be this very earth. For a thousand years after the second coming, it will still be this earth. And then the new home will be on the new earth that God will make, never in the present heaven. So these false divisions that are made to say that the rapture is going up and the second coming is descending are false divisions created to present false evidence for a false doctrine, which is not supported by scripture. Okay. So let's go on to his third irrefutable proof. In the pre-tribulation rapture, Jesus will appear in the air at the second, in the air. At the second coming, he will descend to the Mount of Olives as a prelude to his earthly reign. I mean, that itself is kind of a, you know, Silly argument, because Jesus will appear. If he's coming down to the Mount of Olives, he's coming from up in heaven, of course he's going to appear in the air first, right? Unless he instantaneously, you know, lands in the Mount of Olives. But we've been told he's going to be seen. Every eye shall see him up there in the cloud, coming in the clouds of heaven, okay? And then he will come down to the air. So naturally, he's going to pass through the air. 
So, you know, how this proves the pre-tribulation rapture that Jesus will appear in the air? I don't know. At his second coming, he will descend to the Mount of Olives. But yeah, he's going to descend to the Mount of Olives through the air, right? Through the atmosphere above us. That is what we are told is going to happen. He's not going to magically just appear in the Mount of Olives. That is not what the Bible teaches. In both John and Paul's writings, the promise of a heavenly home awaits for the born-again Christian. We call this the kingdom of God. But in the second coming, a thousand-year kingdom is established on earth known as the kingdom of heaven. Christians are never promised an earthly home, but an heavenly one. I will say it's the other way around. Christians are never promised a heavenly home in this time that man has been given this earth. And even in the final analysis in the new creation, they are still going to be on the earth because the new heaven itself is going to be on the new earth. So this idea that they've been promised a heavenly, yes, they've been promised the kingdom of heaven, which is within them, but that is not like a physical place. The Jews and tribulation saints were never promised that. They get instead a home on the earth. The church is mentioned 19 times in the first three chapters of Revelation, but there is no mention of the church between Revelation 4.1 and Revelation 19.1. John 14.2.3, the rapture. Revelation 24, the second coming. Now, I've already proven that the second coming is a multi-stage event of Jesus' descent from heaven to earth, which will occur over a period of time. The Bible does not teach that he will leave heaven one moment and be on the earth the next. He will leave heaven with his heavenly host. He will descend into the lower heavens where his sign will be visible from the earth. He will send his angels to gather together his elect, very few of whom will come from the earth. The majority of them will be the dead in Christ. But all the gathered elect will be resurrected into their immortal bodies, thus fulfilling their blessed home of resurrection, hope of resurrection at Jesus' second coming. Then he will destroy the beast and his armies on earth and feed their flesh to the birds of prey. That will be invited to the great supper of God. Then he will continue his descent and land on the Mount of Olives along with his resurrected elect. Then will begin his thousand-year reign on earth. All these events noted here are part of his second coming, and this includes the gathering together of the elect or the so-called rapture. So the rapture is just one event among the many events that comprise the entirety of the second coming, that comprise all the events that happened during the second coming of the glorious appearing of the great God and of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, you mentioned this story about the church being mentioned, you know, which they again use as some kind of fake proof for a pre-trib rapture. But again, I talked about that in the last week, so I'm not going to go into it here. But the church is mentioned in the end of the book of Revelation that Jesus has sent his angels to testify to the churches, the things that are written herein. Okay, that means that the entire book of Revelation was written to the churches. Okay, there's no one because the church is the assembly of the people of God. Whether they're Gentiles or Israelites, it doesn't matter. It's written to all believers for all time. That's what it means. So, you know, to say that just because it's not mentioned in those chapters, it means that there's been a pre-tribulation rapture. Sorry, false and lying and deceptive teaching. Now, in regards to John 14, 1, 2, which this person mentions, about the heavenly mentions, the lying pre-trib like I showed you the video clip, okay? In regards to John 14, 1 and 2, 1 to 3, about the heavenly mansion, that lying pre-trib doctrine, promoting false prophets and teachers. So they always tell us, oh, these mansions, that means this is a pre-trib rapture is coming. As I previously stated, the present heaven where the throne of God is situated is not the home of man, whether living or dead. Very important to understand this. While it is true that some souls of people that have died are kept in heaven for a season. As, for example, the souls under the altar of those who were beheaded for the word of God, as we read in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, it tells us, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. I will come back to Revelation 6, 9 and Revelation 7, 14 about the martyrs that no man can number that are domiciled in heaven for a period of time, not in pearly mansions, mind you. Okay, They're not like living 
uh, fancy free and you know luxury life in mansions up there. No, they're not. They're under the altar. They're in front of the throne of God. Okay, but they are under the altar. They're in front of the throne of God. They are waiting. They are waiting for something. The ones in Revelation 6, 9 are waiting for their blood to be avenged on them that dwell on the earth. Why? Because they want the ones that dwell on the earth, they are the ones that kill them. And then their brethren, a great multitude can, which no man can number, also find their way up to heaven. How? Because we are told in Revelation 6, 9, Jay will be killed just as you have been killed. We are going to wait for them. Okay, they are going to wait for their you wait for your vengeance to come and also the hope of your resurrection to be fulfilled, which has not yet been fulfilled for them. But what is important to see here is that they don't have these fancy mansions with these fancy color schemes that, you know, people are dreaming about with all the fancy, you know, marble flooring and granite countertops in the bathrooms. No, 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 no. That is not where they're living. Because those mansions don't exist up there. That is not what John, Jesus meant when he was talking about mansions in John 14, 1 to 3. So John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, where I am there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. You know how this passage of scripture is presented as evidence for a pre-trib rapture is totally beyond me. The teaching is, according to these false prophecy teachers, that Jesus is up there, busy working as a carpenter or a mason or, you know, electrician or plumber or something, Preparing mansions with marble floors, granite countertops, gold bathroom pictures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, according to your wishes, as just as that man said in that video, that Jesus know what you're dreaming about, and he's he's fulfilling your dreams up there, as if Jesus got nothing better to do. And this is the clip that I played for you as to what these false prophets are teaching. That man said that God knows what color scheme you want in your mansion, how many rooms it will have, etc. What they teach is. That Jesus is up there building something like a Roman palazzo or a villa that God is busy creating for us believers. And moreover, not only is he doing that, these mansions will not be given to the believers that are already up there, even those who have been martyred for their faith. As, for example, the great multitude in Revelation 7.14 and the souls under the altar in Revelation 6.9. no. God has decided to wait for the very few fat American and Western believers who are so special. They will send Jesus secretly to go get them and then party with them for seven years as his beautiful creation down below is being destroyed. An untold number of his creatures, not just man, but his beasts and fowl and fish are dying horrible deaths, not just on the earth, but even up in the heavens. We can read that in Isaiah 34. My, my soul shall be bathed in heaven. In Revelation 12, it tells us, Rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them, because the, 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 the beast, the serpent, the dragon, is come down to the people of the earth and can no longer torment you. So yeah, all these evils exist up there too. So we are told that, you know, these very select group of people who are raptured out of here, in the pre-tribulation rapture, they will party for seven years, even as God's wrath will have become so great that no man will be allowed into his presence until the last drop of that wrath has been poured out on the earth, as we read in Revelation 15, 8. And the temple was filled, filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So these deceivers will have us believe that while God's wrath is being poured out upon the earth, the party in heaven will continue even without God's attendance. Because obviously man can't go into his presence, but yet there's a party going on 
God's not there, but you know, let's party on. Let's have a marriage supper of the Lamb without the Lamb. What an idiotic and evil and deceptive and lying and pernicious teaching. As evidence in scripture, as for example, in Revelation 7, 14, a great multitude that no man can number will indeed come to heaven during the time of the great tribulation. At the time of sorrows, not before it. But they will be killed here on earth to get up there. They will not make it there through a pre-trib rapture. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 10. 9 and 10 makes it very clear that multitudes have been beheaded and martyred already and their souls are up there. But many more will be similarly killed during the time of the tribulation, just as Jesus warned in Matthew 24, 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Okay, that's pretty plain teaching, is it not? And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. The word afflicted in Matthew 24, 9 is G2347 Thalipsis, which literally means pressure. Okay, and I've talked about that a lot, which is generally translated either as tribulation or sometimes as affliction. This is the same word that is used in Revelation 7:14 about the multitude that came out of the great tribulation of the great Thalipses. Same as what Jesus told us would happen in Matthew 24, 9. Revelation 7, 14 is a fulfillment of Matthew 24, 9 and of Revelation chapter 6, 6 verse 10, that during the time of tribulation, a multitude that no man can number is going to be killed, which is their flight path to heaven. It is not through imaginary air rapture. So what believers need to prepare for is tribulation, great affliction, and martyrdom. Not a beam me up, Scotty, Star Trek, lying avenue escape from the trials and tribulations that we all must face because of our faith in Jesus. So if a multitude that no man can number is being killed during the tribulation, what happened to the pre-tribulation rapture? Where did that go? It says it's a multitude that no man can number. So if that greater multitude was still left here on the earth during the tribulation, where is this pre-tribulation rapture? And where are they in the book of Revelation partying and, you know, having a jolly good time? Do you read about that anywhere? I don't. I do not. Because it's not in the Bible. Let's continue and study what Jesus meant when he said he was going to prepare a place for us. Did he mean... He was preparing a brick and mortar or metal and glass building? Or does God's mansions have an entirely different meaning? The word mansion is G3438, Monet. And the definition is a staying and abiding, a dwelling and abode. Okay, And metaphorically, this is the meaning that we really want to concentrate on and spend some time on. Metaphorically, of God, the Holy Spirit, indwelling believers. The word mansion means a dwelling. But in the New Testament, does it mean a building made of stone as a temple in Jerusalem? Is that what Jesus meant when he said he was going to prepare a place for us and would himself come to take us there? Look at the last definition of this word in Thayer's Dictionary. It says metaphorically of God the Holy Spirit indwelling believers. What does the New Testament teach us in so many different writings and in so many words of Jesus and of the apostles about the build, about which building God is building and for whom it is being built. Okay, let's look at 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Ephesians 2, 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth up unto an holy temple in the Lord. In whom, look at verse 22, in whom you also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And then in Ephesians 4.15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body 
fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. To edify is to build up. In 1 Peter 2, 5, we read, Ye also as lively stone are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Christ Jesus. So what are the mansions and abodes that God is building? Is it not us, the living stones, who are the temple of God? Is God building a building for us or is he building a building for himself? What does the Bible teach us, especially the New Testament, especially the writings of the Apostle Paul? That the building that God is building is us. He is not busy building like a brick and stone building with, you know, our favorite color schemes as this man is teaching you. Is he not building us, preparing us as a bride adorned for her husband? As we read in Revelation 21 too, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. What did Jesus teach in John 14 too? I go to prepare a place for you. The word prepare in both Revelation 20, 21, that, you know, I saw the new Jerusalem city, new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared. So what is God preparing his building or is he preparing like, you know, cutting like, you know, chopping wood and cutting stone, et cetera, to build buildings up there. What a ridiculous teaching. Prepared as a bride adored for her husband. It's the same word that John, Jesus said he's going to prepare a place and then we are told that he has prepared the bride. The word prepare in both Revelation 21, 22 and John 14, 2 is the same Greek word, G2090, heto, himatso, which literally means to make ready. Is that not what we read in scripture after scripture, which I just read some of them for you in the New Testament, that the body of Christ, the temple of the Lord is being made ready for habitation by God? Who was the mansion then? Are we not the mansions? So the mansions that Jesus is preparing are not buildings of stone, but living stones that are being polished and refined to be made suitable for habitation by God through his spirit, as we just read in Ephesians 2.20. Furthermore, we are lyingly taught that after the pre-trib rapture, the marriage supper of the Lamb will take place in the present heaven for a period of three and a half or for seven years, it varies. You know, some people say three and a half, some people say seven. But what do we just read in Revelation 21, 2? That the bride of the Lamb will not even be ready until after the day of judgment in Revelation 20. What do we read in Revelation 19, verses 7 to 9? Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready has been prepared, has been refined, polished, purified, made white. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So the marriage supper of the Lamb will begin when the bride, after the bride has been prepared and adorned with living jewels and precious stones, and she will not be re revealed until Revelation 21, when the new Jerusalem, which is the living temple, which is the real mansions, whose chief cornerstone is the Lord Jesus himself has been revealed and comes down to the new earth from God out of heaven. As I taught previously, the present heaven is not the abode of man. Even though many who die in Jesus are preserved as living souls in this present heaven, it is not the home of man. It is for the host of heaven, which are spirit creatures like angels. They are not flesh and blood like man. That's why even the mankind that is dwelling up there, they are souls. But these souls, though they paid the ultimate price on earth, by laying down their own lives for their faith, are given no mansions to dwell in. Rather, they are being fitted to become the mansions in which God himself will dwell. 
These living mansions are the new Jerusalem, the new heaven prepared and made ready for the new creatures in Christ, who are the body of Christ, who are his building. The present heaven is not the home for the new creatures in Christ for whom God is preparing an entirely new creation. So this teaching that mansions are, are, are built of, are, are of stone, that mansions of stone are being built in the present heaven for a select few believers is an asinine, illogical, unintelligent, deceptive, and lying teaching that tragically is believed by too many so-called believers because they're ignorant of God's word and they're too lazy to study it for themselves. Moreover, the teaching is that believers will be given these mansions after the preacher rapture. Once they are preacher raptured up there, they're going to be here. Oh, God's going to start handing out the keys. Here you go. Here's Johnny. This is you. You go to number five. Here, here, here you go, Peter. That's number 17 for you. You know what I mean? Oh, so stupid. They're given these mansions after the preacher rapture in which they will dwell for a maximum of seven years. You know, this man in this lying video said that they will dwell in these mansions forever. But, you know, if after seven years, they're going to come down with Jesus to the earth and start reigning with him for a thousand years on the earth. And then God is going to destroy the present heaven and all of creation is going to be burnt up, as you read in Second Peter 3.10. How are they going to be living in these mansions forever? They're not, right? So they're only going to be living in them for a maximum of seven years. Okay. Yet we can brief plainly see that even after the tribulation has begun and after the first five seals have already been opened a great number of martyrs are not partying they're not enjoying the marriage supper of the lamb in pearly mansions but are waiting under the altar before God's throne crying out for their blood to be avenged on them that dwell on the earth similarly in Revelation 7.14 a great multitude that no man can number, newly arrived in heaven because they were killed on earth, are standing before the throne with palms in their, hand, in their hands, but they're not given any mansions to dwell in or given an invitation to go party in their new mansions at the Mary Supper of the Lamb. It seems that these mansions and invitations to the party are only reserved for big fat preachers from down south who alone seem to be worthy of escaping the tribulation, who alone seem to be worthy of, of these heavenly mansions. So God has allegedly prepared these mansions for this one generation out of the at least dozens of generations that have already come and gone since the Garden of Eden, many of whom have believed in Jesus, have lived for Jesus, even when they didn't know him as Jesus, and have died for their faith in God, you know, they were not considered worthy of these mansions, just these very few people who don't even know what pressure or tribulation really means, who've never had like a day of hunger and, and lack in their lives. They are going to be considered worthy and they're going to be given these heavenly mansions and these parties for seven years. So God has allegedly prepared these mansions for this one generation and they will inhabit them for a maximum of seven years after which they will come back down to earth and then God will burn everything up as we read in 2 Peter 3.10 and he will make the new heaven and the new earth. We do not see any of the believers of previous generations residing in such mansions because the Bible does paint a picture of what's happening up in heaven in the book of Revelation in particular. And we don't see that. We do not see if any believers, any of the believers of previous generations residing in such mansions, nor do we see them parting in heaven celebrating the marriage supper, marriage supper of the Lamb as we have been told, will be enjoyed by the raptured saints. The reason, the reason, my friends, why the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is an eternal event and is not limited to just seven years, and also it is not meant for the benefit of just a select few, like these raptured saints that they are like want us to believe, but it is for all of God's elect from Adam onwards to the last person that will be fitted into the living building of New Jerusalem. And this cannot take place until after the great day of judgment of Revelation 20. And the reason is that the body of Christ, his bride will not be complete and fully ready until after the day of judgment. We can read in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, that the dead, 
who were not a part of the first resurrection in Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, will be awakened after the thousand-year reign of Jesus on earth, and then they will be judged according to their works in the body. Now, some of these will enter into the resurrection of life, into everlasting life, as we can read in both John 5, 29 and in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. These who are a part of the second resurrection, they too are the body of Christ. They too are or will become the temple of God. And therefore, they too are the bride of the Lamb. So the bride will not be complete until after Revelation 20. Therefore, the bride is not revealed until Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. And the marriage supper of the Lamb does not commence until such time. Therefore, both the teachings of mansions in the present heaven and of the seven-year marriage supper of the Lamb are false teachings taught by ignorant deceivers, many of whom are well aware that they are ministers of Satan, and it is their job to disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness in order to deceive the lazy so-called believers who do not take the time to study for themselves, and therefore they do not show themselves approved unto God. All right, my friends, I'm going to now end this, stop this here. And at this moment in time, I will definitely invite one and all to please share anything on this topic or even on any other topic that might be on your mind. Just unmute and go right ahead. Hey, Brother Paul, everybody here. I hope everybody's having a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Um, Keeping in mind that I'm still pretty new to this whole studying, and, and trying to understand the word. Um, in Revelation 13, chapter or verse 15, it says that uh and cause that as many would not worship the image should image of the beast should be killed. So with that in mind, um I'm assuming that Jesus returns pretty shortly after that because it doesn't seem like many people would be alive, if any at all. Am I a little off on that or am I kind of on the right track here? I think that's a very good uh, conclusion <clears throat> because the events from after Revelation 13, okay, as we go into Revelation 14, where basically the sign of the Son of Man, as we read about in Matthew 24, 29, will already have appeared in heaven. We can see the Son of Man on the cloud in heaven. It's, that's in Revelation chapter 14. So what is left to be fulfilled after that is Revelation, the events of Revelation 16, 17, and 18 primarily as far as judgment and wrath pouring out of the wrath of God is concerned. So this time, as I have concluded and taught in the past, that these three chapters, they, in my opinion, are the time when we are told that the days need to be cut short. Because you correct that even by this time, there will be not many people left. And if these days were not cut short, there would no flesh be saved, the Bible tells us. So these events of 16, 17, and 18, in my opinion, in Daniel, there's a very mysterious scripture. Again, like I said, many things are still sealed, and we will not have a full understanding of them till we are closer to the time of their fulfillment. But it is saying, you know, okay, the certain things are going to take 1,290 days, and blessed is he who comes unto the 1,335th day. Okay, So that's a period of 45 days or so. Okay. In some places, we read a lot about the 1260 days. So my conclusion is that the events of those last three chapters, and if you read Revelation 16 particularly, as compared to the time of the trumpets or the time of the seals, the events are moving in such rapid fire succession, one after the other, that you know that these things are happening very quickly. So my conclusion is that those events are going to last maybe two, two and a half months at the most. 45 to 75 days at the most, in my opinion. Okay, that is the cutting short of the days. And therefore, and the purpose of that, of course, is that God is going to preserve some flesh alive, which it would not be. And that is the time of God's great wrath, from which all the believers will have been saved in that, that reaping the sickle, the harvest, the so-called rapture takes place in Revelation 14. But that also means that if this is only a matter of a month or two, that the majority of the tribulation 
period of 38 or so odd years will already have been completed, which means that we as believers are going to be required to endure unto that time. Some of us are going to be killed. There are, there are more than one time of martyrdom through the book of Revelation. One in particular we read about in the book of Reve in, in uh, Revelation 7, okay? That is quite obvious about that great multitude that comes out of the great tribulation. And then after that, of course, the second one is at the time of the beast and the mark. And I think there is some that are going to be in between as well at the time of the trumpets and the two witnesses, etc. So essentially, we believers are going to be counted as sheep for the slaughter all through this period of time. Okay. So that means that by the time we get to after the time of the mark of the beast, very few of believers are even going to be around to be gathered together, okay, to be raptured, so to speak, which happens in Revelation 14. So that was kind of a long answer to your question. But yeah, you are on the right track that yes, those days are going to be cut short. And yes, also true that by then, by the time of the trumpet stage, and into the thunders of Revelation chapter 10 and the two witnesses time in Revelation 11 and also the persecution of the woman in Revelation 12 about which I really don't have a whole lot of understanding at this present time. I think that is also something that is still sealed very much that uh, most of the killing, so to speak, of both believers and also of the rest of the general population will have occurred so that by the time we get to Revelation chapter 16, it is quite possible that maybe only a quarter of the population that is alive today will be left or maybe even less. All right. So I hope that answered your question. Yes. Thank you very much, Brother Paul. I have seen your previous teachings on that, but uh, it's such a detailed book that it's hard to keep everything in my mind, especially you know, being fairly new to this. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. The Bible is what the Bible is. The word is what the word is. We cannot go around it. It's only plan A. Here's Ephesians 5 and 6. And you were speaking about how people try to separate uh, the uh, ecclesia, meaning um, the Jews and the Gentiles and the church, uh, the church and the uh, um uh, in, in, in the uh, 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 rapture and the church is going to be gone. Ephesians 4 and 5, it reads that one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Okay, then um, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Jesus Christ. We just take the word as how the word is laid out. There is no plan B. Jesus Christ is plan A. There is no for now. When I started out speaking about man always tries to devise a way. The reason is because they're not wanting to, they're not willing and wanting to work it out the way God has it set up. So here we go with John 4 and 18. There is no fear in love but perfect love cast out fear because fear hath taught me uh, fear um, that he that feareth is not made perfect in love now i'm not sitting here saying that i'm made perfect in love i desire to be made perfect in love the lord i'm that stone the lord is he's chipping away at me and he's chipping away that stone in my mind and in my heart i desire to have the perfect love that i finished i just finished reading about so i can take the word of god and the will of god as a whole and you spoke about the mansion and how people speak about mansions and stuff like that. It says, here's um, um, 2 Timothy 4 and 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not, and not to me only, but unto all those also that love, love his appearing. Mm -hmm. This teaching in the in, in these congregations, in this false rapture, 
and this fear of this man, this fear that man have man to go stock up all these guns, run out into the woods and stock up all kinds of food and stuff like that. Guess what? You're not going to get away from the wrath of God if you're not living according to the will of God. Thank you're you. correct, brother. And thank you for uh, sharing your uh, you know, knowledge and understanding with us. And uh, that uh, comes only from knowing and understanding and studying the scriptures for yourself. So I'm grateful and thankful for everyone that takes the time to do that here. And may God bless us all with more and deeper understanding and revelation in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whom we do not see in with our natural eyes, but who who into whose image we are being shaped invisibly each and every day of our lives, for which we are eternally grateful. All right, my dear friends, if uh, anybody else has something to add, please go ahead. Otherwise, we'll uh, finish this meeting here for today. And uh, hopefully, by God's uh, grace, we will continue to study his word tomorrow as well. All right. God bless you all. Have a blessed day in our Lord, wherever you happen to be. And uh, may the Lord keep you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may he make his light to shine upon you, you know, and give you peace. And that's what we pray for, is peace and contentment in this world of turmoil, tribulation, and affliction. Amen, my brothers and sisters. God bless you. Oh